You wake up in a dark and dingy bathroom. You haven't seen this place before, or have you? It's honestly hard to tell. There's an old TV that flicks on, and a puppet begins to talk to you, but that has to take a back seat as there's a massive device stuck to your head. You recognize it from other damaged survivors you've talked to and know that you have to remove it immediately. Do you rush and risk clumsily activating it, or do you take it slow and risk running out of time? You manage to get it off, but realize it's going to be a very, very long day. On today's episode of Playing With Fear. Welcome to Joe Blow Horror Videos Playing With Fear, where we take a look at some of the landmark horror titles throughout the history of gaming. Today we're looking at what is a fairly obvious choice for a game adaptation, with the only oddity being that it was released so late into the series' life. Saw took audiences and theater chains by storm in late October of 2004, and the licensed game Saw would get released in October of 2009. That would end up being just a few short weeks before the sixth installment of the film series. It's pretty much exactly what you'd think it would be, but how does it fare as a game and compared to the series of horror movies it's based on? Most people are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you. Not anymore. James Wan and Lee Winnell would have a mega hit on their hands when Saw was released on October 29th, 2004. I was personally blown away at 19, leaving the theater wanting more and trying to comprehend what I'd just seen as it was different than anything I'd ever seen before in my life. Two years later, Hostel would come out and ramp up the gore, but lose some of the cerebral aspects of Saw. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoy Hostel as well, but Saw is a whole different animal. The independent movie that could would also be the new yearly Halloween tradition. In a cinematic world of straight-to-video sequels or flat-out stagnation in horror franchises, Saw would crank out films nearly every year for a good while. While the critical praise would never match the first film, every entry made more than enough money to justify moving forward with a sequel. The first seven would be released every October from 2004 to 2010, with a few more coming in 2017, 2021, and the tenth coming up in 2023. In addition to every single one being released theatrically, getting to ten movies in a horror series is quite the accomplishment. In addition to making careers for James Wan and Lee Winnell, who would go on to give us some really great stuff, Saw was very popular, and when a franchise is popular, it gets both stuff and things. Merchandise would flow with toys, apparel, decorations, and it would lend itself wonderfully to mazes at Universal Studios' Halloween Horror Nights. While there are shockingly no comic books or novels based on the property, the allure of a video game being just too much, and with horror games being incredibly popular, the world of Saw would be transported to the seventh generation of consoles. Let the game begin. As the third movie was approaching release, we would get our first announcement for a game for the franchise with the idea of releasing it concurrently with the already announced fourth film. Brash Entertainment was the studio that was going to develop and release the game with the help of Twisted Pictures, the studio in charge of all the movies. Brash is an interesting choice as they'd only done kids games up to that point like Alvin and the Chipmunks and Space Chimps for the PS2. Brash would struggle to stay above water though, and the game would be passed to Zombie Studios. And even though that's a great horror name for a game studio, they made their name with the Spec Ops games from the late 90s to early 2000s. Since Lionsgate wasn't in the games business, they decided they needed a publisher as well, and this time they chose a heavy hitter. Konami stepped in, and this would probably make most horror fan games jump for joy as the studio was the owner of the famous Silent Hill series, which is indisputably on the Mount Rushmore of horror game series. Saw would release on October 9th, 2009 for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, much closer to Saw 6's release, with a PC port coming October 22nd, just a day before the movie premiere. The game opens up with Detective David Tapp waking up in Whitehurst Asylum with the popular reverse bear trap attached to his head. Tapp is Danny Glover's character from the first film, who has clearly survived somehow, and the story takes place between the first and second films. Tap gets out of the trap after watching a video from everyone's favorite puppet, Billy. Well, it's voiced by series villain Jigsaw, but Billy is sort of the mascot, along with Pighead. We'll see Pighead later, too. Tap escapes his room by finding a combination to the door lock written on the bathroom stalls. Tap starts running into people and quickly realizes that he is not alone in the asylum. He has his own game to play to escape, but he's also a central figure in everyone else's game as inside his body is the only key to escape this nightmare. David goes through the asylum, avoiding traps both obvious with glass on the ground for his bare feet and hidden like shotgun traps attached to the doors, syringes and toilets, and acid in barrels, along with some other franchise staples. Tap's game involves saving a few select hostages while fighting his way through the maze, avoiding traps and other victims, and solving puzzles. 
The first of his victims to save is Amanda, who we all know as someone who survived her game and later becomes an apprentice for Jigsaw. While searching around the asylum, David will find notes about the asylum as well as notes from Jigsaw about what's going on. After a brief time with Amanda, she's taken away by Pig Mask and Tap has to push on before he too is taken to another location. He wakes up in another part of the asylum, this time with an exploding collar that will react and blow up in close contact with others wearing theirs. The next person that is part of David's game is Jennings Foster, who he finds stuck in a pendulum-type trap. Jennings is freed and flees to try to find a way out of the building, and if the name is familiar, it's because he's another detective from the films that apparently killed a man in a hit-and-run and framed another guy for it, which is kind of why he ended up part of the game. David makes his way through a ton more traps and finds various weapons to use, including a gun. He eventually runs into Melissa Singh, the wife of his partner that died chasing Jigsaw in the first film, and saves her from another nasty trap. Despite being saved, Melissa still hates David as she blames him for her husband's death. She leaves and locks David in another wing of the hospital. Tap next finds Oswald McGillicuddy, which is the actual name they used, I assure you. A reporter who has followed Jigsaw's crimes, but who Jigsaw feels didn't understand or report the message properly and needs to be in the game. Tap saves him from a trap setup, but he's killed quickly after tripping a trap ahead of Tap, and now I'm done being Dr. Seuss for a while. David continues to move through the asylum until he finds Obi Tate, who actually put out a request in the papers to be tested by Jigsaw. David sets him free, but Tate's angry he couldn't do it himself and runs off. The final victim is Jeff Riedenauer, who was previously saved by Tap and Sing from a trap. Tap is successful and then has to fight and kill Pighead to escape. Finally, Tap is presented with two choices, a door marked Truth and a door marked Freedom. Choosing Freedom lets you out of the maze and the game ends, but David is so distraught at you not finding the answers that he takes his own life. Choosing Truth leads you to fighting Jigsaw, who you eventually defeat only to find out that it's Melissa Singh finishing her game. She stumbles to her feet and walks directly into another shotgun death trap, dying exactly as her husband did. This is too much for Tap to take, again, and this time he ends up in an active asylum. No happy ending here, regardless of what door you take. For the record, the canonical ending is freedom, though you wouldn't find that out until the game's sequel. He doesn't want us to cut through our chains. He wants us to cut through our feet. The game tries to be a typical survival horror of the time. You go from room to room and section to section, doing some sort of cycle involving fighting enemies, solving puzzles, and finding key items to use. The puzzles could be as simple as reaching into something gross or painful to find something needed, or reconfiguring a power grid, or, when they ran out of ideas, one of those dumb picture puzzles where you have to slide the sections around to put together the picture properly. Unfortunately, the entire game looks pretty much the same wherever you go, with the exception of your brief stint outside, and all the puzzles just start repeating themselves, just getting larger in scale. Combat is usually a one-on-one -on -one with handheld weapons, and eventually firearms, but the coast combat is pretty rough in both looks and execution. Firearms do the trick best, but you can also scavenge for parts and build your own traps to set that, frankly, don't work the way you want them to in-game. All of the enemies fight the same, but do look different based on what part of the game you're in and what traps they have associated with them. The only exception to this is fighting the only boss of the game with Pighead, and even then they just look slightly different than the others and have a larger health pool. With the game being released in 2009, it looked like a lot of other third-person titles, and the graphics don't really hold up compared to today or the lovingly crafted 8- and 16-bit games of the past. Health items can be picked up to save for later or used immediately depending on if they're bandages or health hypos. You start the game with a lighter to see in the dark, and that can eventually be upgraded to a flashlight which is easier to use and lets you see more. The random notes you can find would have been cool if they were personalized, but they all read in the same lame looking pop-up box when you find them. While the characters sometimes exist from the previous films, only Tobin Bell lends his voice to the cast returning as Jigsaw, and he sounds about like he does in the rest of the series. Earl Alexander plays Tap, and he would have small roles in the far superior Suffering games from a few years prior, while Cortana herself, Jen Taylor, lends her voice as Amanda. It's cool and they do a good job, but it would have been more fun if they could have secured the original actors, or, you know, if Tap looked anything like Danny Glover. All in all, it's an inferior survival horror game that could have been great with the license it had and Konami producing it. Those who don't appreciate life do not deserve life. This game should have been scary but then I guess the movies aren't really scary either. They have lots of tense moments and some jump scares, but don't really have an overall scary tone. 
In that sense, the game succeeds at mimicking the movies, as there are certainly jump scares from both enemies and traps, and there's tension trying to figure out the solutions of the puzzles the game presents. Unfortunately, with the stagnant number of puzzles available, this quickly wears thin and is completely lost with secondary playthroughs. Maybe played with the lights off and the sound turned up, you can get some scares out of it, but it's often too frustrating in gameplay elements to give proper fright. While I can't find sales records for the game, it must have done well enough to get a sequel with Saw, Flesh and Blood being released just a year later from Konami and Zombie again. Both games had mediocre reviews, although seem to have cult followings nowadays. Unfortunately, both games have been removed from digital stores and they aren't exactly cheap to buy physically. I'd say seek them out if you're a diehard Saw or diehard survival horror fan only. With over a decade since the last release, would you like to see a new game with the new movie? Have you played either of these games? Let us know in the comments. Sorry, we're closed. Well, that's all for Joe Blow Horror Originals Playing With Fear. Thanks for sticking around, and we'll see you on some of our other shows. Game over.